Good evening. I'm David Gergen, and I have the pleasure to welcome you to one of the Kennedy School Forum, one of the prestigious forums in this community, one of the most prestigious forums in this community. And tonight we're graced by the presence of Wendy Kopp. Uh, we're delighted to have you here, Wendy. Thank you. And uh, she's going to be engaged in a conversation with the dean of the school. Uh, a few words about Wendy Kopp. When she was a senior at Princeton in 1989, she wrote a senior thesis uh, calling for a teacher corps. Uh, be careful of what you write in a senior thesis uh, because uh, she decided to try to put it into, into action. Many people believe, believed it would never work. Uh, within the first year, she had 2,500 applications. It got off the ground quickly. Uh, some philanthropists helped um, to make it a reality. But it has now grown into the, I think, that uh, foremost force for education reform in the country. Uh, it is an enormously successful program that has had a, uh, an extraordinary appeal uh, to the younger generation. As many of you know, Teach for America uh, asks uh, se college seniors to apply and then, if, if accepted, to spend two years teaching in the toughest uh, urban and rural schools in the country. Uh, this last year, uh, she, there were 6,000 spots available. There were 60,000 applications, 10 to 1. Almost as hard to get into Harvard as it is to get into uh, Teach for America. Uh, they have 32,000 alumni now. Uh, and what's interesting about this is Cynic said in the beginning, the folks who come into Teach for America, they're just going to punch their card and um, improve their resume, and off they're going to go to business school or law school or something of that sort. 65% of the alumni are working full time in education reform. That's a remarkable number. And then and if you look at the successes around the country, let me just tell you just for a moment about New Orleans. Before Katrina, the graduation rate in New Orleans in high school was 54%. Uh, the, the hurricane actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise in many, in many ways because it brought a great number of young people who wanted to come to New Orleans and participate in the renewal of New Orleans. And Teach for America was right out there in front. Uh, today, one in five New Orleans teachers comes from Teach for America. Forty percent of the school principals are TFA alums. And the graduation rate has gone from 54 percent to 78 percent, several points above the national average. That's progress. For New Orleans, so there's a miracle going on in New Orleans, as is beginning to appear in, in a number of other cities that I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about tonight. Excuse me, if you can tell, I'm, I'm an advocate. I happen to the, I have the privilege of being on the board uh, and serving with some other folks in, in this good university, uh, and I'm, I'm a big believer in it. Wendy, as time went on, and this was such a success, other countries noticed. They started coming to her and said, can you help us start Teach for America in our country? Uh, and she formed an organization called Teach for All. It's a global organization. And in the last year, a couple of years, she's made a transition from being the active CEO of Teach for America to being the chairman, an active hands-on chairman of the board for Teach for America as she's taking on responsibility for this global challenge. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that tonight. This has not been an easy ride. Education is terribly politicized in this country today, far more than it should be. You know, whether it's Common Core, as we saw what happened in Indiana yesterday, or it's charter schools that are controversial, say in New York, um, and there's a political fight over that on one issue after another. This is, these are really difficult issues, but still, the young people sign up and say, sign me up, I wanna go do this. So we're gonna hear from her tonight, and, uh, and as I say, having this conversation will be our, our dean, who has been here now some 10 years. And um, he, he, you should know that before he became dean and became absorbed, we tried to renew and build this school in which he's done such a wonderful job. He was renowned as a scholar and, and as someone who brought theory to practice and was a major, major architect of welfare reform in this country, which has, was a, a very, very difficult issue, but he's been a scholar on poverty and other issues. He's the perfect person to talk to Wendy uh, about how are we going to close the education gaps in this country so that no children will be left behind. And one day, all children, as Wendy would say. Thank you. Uh, over to you, David. Thank you. Uh, Wendy, it's, it's a tremendous honor having you here. As you know well, 
we have quite a few Teach for America graduates uh, here in the school at any one time and, and many more of our own graduates. So uh, and, uh, we share your passion for making the world a better place. And indeed, I'd like to just start by asking you, um, you know, this is always described as someone who's seen your thesis and even in your book, you're like, eh, what should I write about? And all of a sudden there's this and then you, for the last 25 years, uh, near as I can tell you, have gotten no sleep. She's even got a cold today, so uh, be aware. Um, where does this passion come from? Yeah. And what keeps feeding it? Um, I think my initial passion, uh, well, they're, they're linked, but I think different things may probably, this is. We'll work on it, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, <coughs> kept me going and then led me to start. Um, I mean, honestly, the, the original, I mean, I was obsessed. I mean, uh, literally the minute I thought of this idea, I was obsessed. And, and it's true that I've been obsessed ever since. But the thing that first led me to be obsessed about it, I mean, I was a college senior. Honestly, I was in, I, I was in, in a true funk. I mean, I really was in a deep funk. I, I actually, you know, I'd never been in a funk before. I'd been a very motivated, driven by whatever was in front of me person, but literally I didn't want to do a thesis and I didn't want to do any of the things that seemed like they were presenting themselves to me as things to do after you graduated. I, I actually just didn't want to do it. Um, you know, I, we were called the me generation and supposedly we just all wanted to go work on Wall Street and I just thought, first of all, actually I don't know anyone who is dying to go work on Wall Street. I mean, not that it's a problem if there are people who, who do, but I, I didn't know any of them and yet everyone was applying to these. The, the only recruiters were investment banks and management consulting firms. And I actually was trying to figure out what else could I possibly do? And you know, I was a person with few connections. Like <laughs> I didn't have the connections to figure out how do you work on Capitol Hill, although I was trying to figure, I was writing the letters, trying to get internships, you know. And, and I just felt like, you know what, one day, I, I had become very focused on this issue. I was in the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Policy. I'd become very focused on this, on the issue. I'm honestly, as an academic matter, um, and, and with some personal connection to it through, through folks I knew at Princeton who'd gone to public schools in the South Bronx and such, but to the issue of educational inequity, just the reality that in our country, I mean, it's almost inconceivable, right? Like we are a place that aspires to be a place of equal opportunity and yet, and we call ourselves the land of opportunity, but where you're born determines the educational outcomes you get and and your life outcomes as a result. And that just seemed not right. So I organized a conference on this together with some other folks. And it was at that conference where I realized, you know what, why aren't we being recruited as aggressively to commit two years to teach in our high poverty communities as we were being recruited at the time to commit two years to work on Wall Street? I mean, it was just so clear to me, like all of a sudden, like that is it. We will have thousands of people wanting to channel their energy into something as meaningful as teaching in incredibly high need communities. There were incredible teacher shortages at the time and just incredible needs in, in urban and rural communities. And I thought that would make a real difference in the short term and that it would make a real difference in the long run as well. I mean, I had this idea from the very start that you know we take all these folks who are going to be our nation's future leaders and we have their first two years out of college be working on Wall Street. What if their first two years was teaching in urban and rural communities. Like we would change the consciousness of our country. We'd change everything in the end. We'd change the priorities, the career paths, the, you know, the consciousness of our country. I mean, that, I was obsessed with this idea, just as an, as an idea. I think once I got started, you know, I saw through our incredible, hard, you know, committed teachers um, and ultimately alumni, um, you know, the, the magnitude of the problem we were addressing and honestly, the possibility that, it, that we could solve it. I mean, you know, to see that juxtaposition every day, like to see what happens when you meet kids who are so far behind with the kind of supports that they need and, and with high expectations and to see them excel, I mean, you realize, you know, we can make a meaningful difference against this problem and I, I, as we progressed, I saw that on bigger and bigger scales. Like, yes, we can have whole classrooms that help put kids on a trajectory to greater opportunity. We can do this in whole schools. We can actually make a meaningful difference in whole communities. I mean, you just start realizing, that's why I've never left, because you just realize, wow, like, 
people are everything. This is true in education at least as much as it's true in every other sector. And if we channel, you know, our most precious resource, our most educated, capable talent against this problem, we will make a meaningful difference in our lifetime. So that, that's kind of what's kept me going. And so uh, one of the things you mentioned in uh, a wonderful book, if you haven't read it, called uh, One Day All Children, The Unlikely Triumph of Te Teach for America and What I Learned from It. It's just a wonderful story, and partly it's a wonderful story because you also mentioned that you did actually apply for a number of these jobs, and nobody made an offer. And the last one that turned, that turned you down was Morgan Stanley. I wonder how different the world might have been had that offer come through, although I suspect you wouldn't have taken it anyway. I don't think I would have, but, yeah. <laughs> so you, but you also were incredibly um, courageous, perhaps people would have said foolish at the time. You said, I'm gonna start big, I'm gonna do this, it can be done, in spite of everybody saying, whoa, whoa slow down, take your time, whatever. I want yeah. 500 people the first year, I need two and a half million dollars, I'm gonna go crazy recruiting yeah. them. You've got the 500 people recruited. Only one small problem, you didn't have the money raised yet. So yeah. you have 500 people you've made a commitment to, spectacular people and so forth. Is this a strategy you would recommend to others? <laughs> this is a really tough question because, um, so I had, as I have articulated, I guess, you know, real conviction in this idea. But beyond that, the timing for this was, absolutely perfect right like it was one of those things I swear to you if I hadn't started it someone else was going to start it within the next six months I was actually right about that analysis I mean the mood on college campuses it was true like I wasn't alone I was one of thousands of people who were just searching for a way to make a real difference in the world without finding the path um, the environment in school districts, I mean, this was the days of headlines of, you know, schools opening in New York and LA with 1,200 vacancies. So the school districts were ready and, and waiting for this. Um, and the fall of my senior year, Fortune Magazine ran a cover story that said corporate America is gonna take on America's schools or something like this. Like they were committing themselves to, you know, improving education and, and they actually didn't know what to do. And you know, I knew that there was a lot of corporate philanthropy out there and, and a lot of philanthropy, and it, it went to lots of things that were much less impactful than this. I mean, this is, there's a little bit of naivete in this, but um, so I don't know, all roads led to, in my mind, like I was actually, I didn't feel like I was taking a risk. I felt like this is gonna happen, it's gonna work, we can make it work, and I am glad in retrospect that I did it, of course, because it did work out, but, you but know, there were a lot of sleepless nights and near missing of payrolls and all that. Right? Yeah, Along the this way. is true. This is true. And, and ultimately, you know, you know, ultimately that strategy didn't fully work for us. <laughs> like ultimately we had to figure out a different way of operating that was a little more sane um, to gain stability. Mm -hmm. But in terms of other, you must get the question constantly from other people. You are, after all, in some ways the, the most prominent uh, social entrepreneur out there. Um, about you know, how should they think about it and so forth. Do you have some sort of pearls that you typically share or would like to share? It's By the way, I've tough. heard from several people who yeah. called you early on and just, just the fact that you were willing to take a call and said hang in there and stuff made as much difference as, yeah. as anything. I mean, even now, like working with all these, the, teach, the entrepreneurs, the social entrepreneurs who are starting the Teach for Malaysia's or the Teach for India's or, you know, um, in San Chile, et cetera, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a balance. I think if we all waited for the revenue we needed before we launched, you know, we wouldn't exist. I mean, I'm slightly terrified even talking about this here because I'm starting a new entrepreneurial venture, in all honesty, through Teach for All that doesn't have a clear path to revenue, you know? It, we're starting up, we are, we've got big ambitious goals, we feel it's important to meet them, we don't see a clear path to the revenue we need, and you know, we're trying to make smart, judicious calls that will, you know, it's worked for us in the last six years, but, you know, I, I just think this is, this is the life of social entrepreneurs, you know, and we wouldn't be making the impact we're making um, if we didn't take a little bit of, of risk, but it, it's, you know, it's tough, it's, you know. So one of the things that's, that's quite striking, you said it here, but also in everything else that uh, Teacher America's done is unbelievable emphasis on recruiting. Uh, it sort of, it wasn't just, you know, by the way, you should apply for 
Peace Corps or AmeriCorps or something, you spend enormous time on campuses, individual recruiters for some individual campuses and so forth. Indeed, it was so phenomenal that a few years back, I organized a round table in Washington, D.C. on federal hiring practices, which I think are truly appalling. Um, and that's particularly important since, you know, the Kennedy School, a certain number of our students would like to work for the federal government. And uh, I got the heads of the major unions, uh, I got the, you know, uh, head of the Office of Personnel Management, some cabinet secretaries, people from Congress, and so forth, but um, um, professors. And then I wanted to present them with people that really did know how to do recruiting right. So we had the head of personnel for Google, uh, we had the head of recruiting for GE, the head of diversity for IBM, and Teach for America. Because in many ways, Teach for America was even more effective in terms of its able the capacity to reach out to idealistic young people and the like. Indeed, uh, um, Lisa Clapp, I guess, who's your yeah. SVP for recruitment, or was then, was a part of that. So, but tell me more about why this preoccupation. I mean, they're terrific yeah. folks. You spend enormous money on this. I mean, yeah. is it worth it? Although we don't spend nearly as much as some other <laughs> institutions out there, like our banks, consulting firms, and even the U.S. military. So I, I will say, I mean, this is the core proposition of Teach for America. I mean, the, the thing that, you know, we've realized we need to obsess not only about recruitment, but about, you know, and selection, but about how to train and support them as well. But, you know, this is our mission. Like, you know, we think, you know, uh, truly, if you, if you get a bunch of people working to improve education in a room and ask them, what is the constraint? It's not money, right? Like, it's, it's people. And we have a world that sends, I mean, I was just in Singapore last week, right? And Singapore is known as, I mean, first of all, it's got one of the highest performing education systems in the world, both excellence, equity, the whole bit. And they get, they're known around the world, they get the top third of their folks in terms of academic caliber to, to channel their energy into teaching. And, you know, I wasn't there to pitch the teach for all model, actually. I was there for other reasons entirely. But they just couldn't get over it because they said, wait a minute, like, so you mean our top talent, like the folks who go into finance and law and medicine, you're channeling those people into education. And I'm thinking, aren't you doing that? They're saying, oh no, we don't do that. Here our top talent goes into finance, law, and medicine. <laughs> so I just think education is so fundamental to everything else we all know this right like if we could see rising educational levels and decreasing educational disparities the world would just be a better place we would see you know and yet we, t we our most precious resource we channel it consistently really across borders into finance and you know law and, and medicine which you know thank heaven we've got good people going into medicine um, not that we don't good, need good bankers and good lawyers as well, but we should just have more equity in this. And how do you fix that? You don't fix that by just saying, hey, anyone want to teach? No. Um, so, you know, we go about it. We, we actually spent a lot of time trying to understand what do all these banks and consulting firms do? And we realized, wow. So McKinsey gives 20 Harvard alums who work at McKinsey a million dollars, and this was 10 years ago, and says, go get the 10 best folks you can find at Harvard to come work at McKinsey. That was our competition. So that informed the Teach for America recruitment strategy. We don't have a million dollars, and we don't have 20 alums from Harvard hanging out with time to go wine and dine people at Harvard, so what are we gonna do? And, and you know, it, it informed our strategy in big ways. You know, We realized that in addition to the marketing stuff and the, the kind of positioning of Teach for America, we were gonna have to do the same kind of relationship building that they did, and, and it informed this approach of identifying our top prospects and cultivating them over time. Um, and it's why, you know, I don't know, you know, there are different perceptions out there about Teach for America, but this is not just, you know, we put up a sign and a bunch of people come apply. It's why we've attained the level of, not only the numbers, but the level of the caliber and the diversity of the folks who come in to Teach for America. You know, 55% of our core last year, you know, had experienced in some way the inequities we're working to address, either growing up in a low-income community or, you know, sharing the race and ethnicity of, of the vast majority that of, of kids who Teach for America works with. Um, and that does not happen um, without a deep, deep commitment to diversity and an incredible focus of 
our resources on recruiting a, a diverse core that's far more diverse than, say, our top 350 college campuses, 17% of the grads of whom grew up in low-income communities, 6% of the seniors are Latino, 5% are African American. We are so much more diverse than that. Uh, we need a lot of people from those top 350 schools. It's, I mean, we find a lot of people beyond those top 350 schools, but of course we need people from those schools channeling their energy into education, and they've got to be a lot more diverse than the people in those schools now if we're going to be successful in this effort. So yeah, we think putting a lot of energy into very intentionally recruiting the folks we really need um, to drive the kinds of not only immediate changes in classrooms, but long-term changes over time is, is so let me ask the question that many people here have. What do you have to do to get into Teach for America? What are you looking for? Um, you know, we're basically, uh, I mean, first of all, we've done a lot of studies. We continue to do a lot of studies over time. I mean, now the beauty is we've got all these programs around the world doing lots of studies, trying to figure out what is it that differentiates the most successful teachers and the alumni who go on to make the greatest impact. Like, what can you see at the front end that differentiates the people who have the greatest impact, basically. I think at a high level, you know, we could summarize what we're looking for as, you know, leadership qualities. Um, we've seen that teaching successfully in our highest need classrooms truly is an act of leadership. You know, you're going into a situation, um, your kids are far behind, the resources to meet their extra needs are often not readily apparent, and you need to figure out not how to just survive the year, but how to put your kids on a different trajectory, you know? And that takes vision, it takes the ability to get your kids on an absolute mission so that they're working with you to get there. It takes a lot of purposeful and relentless energy. So we look for those things in people's past, perseverance, the ability to influence and motivate,